All right, guys, happy Thursday and welcome to The Ravid Show. Very happy to have my next guest, uh, Peter Fishman, on The Ravid Show today. Peter Fishman is the CEO and co-founder of Mozart Data. Today, we will be talking a lot around his journey about uh, modern data stack, about analytics and much more. So feel free to have your questions coming in and uh, I'm sure Peter will be super happy to answer them. Uh, also, quickly, uh, uh, a little about Peter and his background. Uh, but before I do that, obviously, feel free to share in comments where you're joining from. And also, we are giving one annual subscription of 365 Data Science. So feel free to put a hashtag 365 Data Science uh, in the chat and you enter the raffle and we'll be announcing a winner by end of the show. All right, guys. Uh, so uh, it's time we uh, I, I give you a, a bit about Peter Fishman, who he is. He uh, Peter has a, a experience of over a decade running data and data adjust, adjacent teams at startups in a variety of industries, including gaming, social, HR benefits, real estate, and cannabis. Uh, when he realized that he was building the same types of modern data stacks at each company, he teamed up with a close friend uh, to start Mozart Data in 2020 and make it really easy for everyone to gather data, automate reporting, and generate insights. He's also co-founded Bacon Hot Sauce in 2010, which sold hundreds of thousands of bottles of hot sauce. So uh, feel free to ask about the hot sauces as well. <laughs> I'm sure Peter will be happy to answer about uh, his journey, not only uh with the uh, you know the modern data stack but also about his previous uh, uh you know the the companies that he has founded i already see a few folks joining in i see joy already here. hey joy how are you uh vikas is here i see uh hashtag 365 data science in the chat already yes a quick reminder for those who are joining in just now you can actually Put in hashtag 365 data science. I'll just let you know where it's actually getting collected. And this is the place where it is getting collected. Uh, so we already, we already have three entries. Uh, so put in hashtag 365 data science. And uh, by end of the show, uh, we will be definitely announcing a winner. And we'll be doing this cool raffle. So get ready for it, guys. Uh, okay, I will take off the screen. And now I will welcome our guest for today. Hey, Peter, welcome to the Ravit Show. How are you? Hey, Ravit, how's it going? Doing great. It, awesome. Uh, very happy to have you here. I was just letting folks know about your hot sauce business too, which uh, did <laughs> amazingly well. So I'm sure people will be talk, asking you questions around that, but uh, not forgetting, obviously, uh, our agenda for today, talking about uh, your journey, modern data stack, data analytics, and much more. So everyone joining in, have your questions coming in. Uh, but to start with, obviously, uh, Peter, I'm sure folks would love to know more about you and your plans. So can you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, first off, thank you for the kind introduction and and, and the background. Um, so I'm Pete Fishman. I go by Fish. Uh, I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Mozart Data. We are the easiest way for teams to spin up a modern data stack. And I know we'll be talking about modern data stacks today. Um, I've spent the last two decades in Silicon Valley building out data and analytics teams at um, uh, growth startups. And I kind of took my experiences from there and started sort of this company inspired by the tools that we found really critical at those companies. Awesome, Pete. Uh, I think uh, you you always keep it short. <laughs> and that's what I like. Uh, you know, you are just like on to point. Uh, okay, uh, let's see who are the folks other than uh, these joining in. We have George. Hey, George. Uh, George is uh, uh, George has a show too, which is fantastic. Lights on data. He creates Lights some amazing, data. amazing insights on uh, data governance. So for folks who are actually wanting to learn about data governance, go follow George. Reach out to him. Uh, I see Aditi is here. Hey, Aditi, and uh, uh, we have already have a question from George. What's the story? How did you come up with Mozart Data? Great. Well, um, first of all, there's no shortage of, of bad puns at our company. So, uh, you know, data teams, when they're really getting their journey started, 
need to effectively bring all the data together, centralize the data. And what, you know, we sort of thought of that as sort of orchestrating the data. There had been a lot of discussion of data orchestration as one of the main roles of um, a data team. And we have, of course, thought if we're going to be a product that's going to replace an early data engineering hire and is going to essentially make uh, the data analyst, the data scientist, a biz ops analyst, very capable of doing the data engineering without that background, um, we were going to be their data orchestration layer. And of course, I thought of uh, Mozart Data as a great um, as a great name for the company. And it's sort of a little bit of how we got started. We composed tables is kind of how we think about it. And of, of course, again, like I said, um, we like to have a little bit of fun with yeah. with both ourselves and, and that essentially, you know, kind of because most most of the day we're dealing with really uh, you know thick and hairy data problems, but uh, but you know we like to have fun as well. Um, so that's kind of where where Mozart got started. Um, yeah. Ultimately, it became a platform to really enable anyone in an organization the power to sort of get started on that data journey. Where we really find success is. Um, you know, you're an organization that's collecting a lot of data in silos, that's generating data, that knows what they want out of the data. Maybe that's a report, maybe that's an automated insight, maybe that's a piece of analysis, whatever it is. Uh, but you don't know sort of the middle steps of, of how to build the data pipeline to get there. And, and we really help you uh, get started on that journey. Okay, that's uh, fair enough and uh, something very unique also. So... Thanks for all that question, George, and thanks for that answer, Pete. Uh, okay, quickly also getting into, obviously, I know for a fact you are fantastic with analytics and, uh, you know, just uh, I'm sure there are many folks who are joining us today and would love to know around analytics. So what do you think are the top skills you recommend our followers uh, cultivate to, to start further in their career in analytics? What would they be? So there, there are technical skills that help you get jobs. So a lot of companies interview mm -hmm. on a set of technical skills that are like critical to the job. So maybe some of these jobs require SQL or some require Python or some require some ability to sort of have data fluency. Maybe that means, you know, sort of how to move and manipulate data, how to maybe pivot data, how to summarize data. I think actually the most important is skill in, in, in data analytics is still just critical thinking. So a lot of practical applications of solving data problems, thinking about causality. So I think the ability to understand kind of uh, when it, when data it, and in what ways uh, is, is data biased is probably the most important skill. And you don't necessarily work on that just as a practitioner. One of the problems in the sort of analytics space is that um, it's often hard to get started because in order to become, you know, what you find is experience matters a lot, which is, you know, you sort of pattern recognize a problem. You say, okay, I've seen this type of problem before. Maybe it's a different context. Like, like you mentioned in, in my introduction, you know, mm -hmm. I've worked in all different types of industries, but ultimately solving the mm -hmm. same problems. So getting reps on a problem is really important. But in order to get those those reps, you actually need data sets to work with. And often you to get the data sets to work with, you need to be mm -hmm. at a company that has those data sets. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 when you say, well, what is your advice? Well, the advice is get into, you know, get into a place so that you can get the reps. Um, the problem is, well, how do you get into the place? Well, that, you know, it's sort of circular logic. Um, typically, what I've found is that for myself, um, how I got, how I strengthened my data skills was to work analyzing data that I was passionate about separate from my job. So I had spent a lot of my, you know, college and grad school careers analyzing, uh, you know, baseball and football statistics. Um, now, that type of analysis is not directly applicable to anything that I've done, uh, you know, in the last few decades in, at tech mm. companies, but it's actually the same type of thinking. You're trying to take a bunch of information and turn it into something useful. You know, it's, it, you know, typically it's something that validates an opinion or, or create or generate ideally generates an opinion about maybe a player. Um, so I think, I think my best advice is work with any data set. Maybe you're passionate about 
movies or maybe you're passionate you know like for me about about sports or maybe you're passionate about government or maybe you're passionate and 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 sort of those all have rich public data sets and maybe you can figure out ways of sort of working with it and answering questions that are interesting to you you know for me i was always you know which player is better than the other player and i think like <laughs> that was that was an argument that i'd have with friends and the ability to go into a data set and mm. and try to make an argument from that data set ultimately is exactly what i found myself doing in my career wow this is uh, amazing and super insightful information thanks for sharing that pete and i'm sure this will also help our audience to understand analytics and get closer to a step where you know obviously they can uh, break into analytics and uh, you know this information will definitely help them okay we have a few more folks joining us uh, <laughs> uh, scott is here scott actually has uh, something uh, to say he says does moza data add a coshell number to uh, yes. my information <laughs> yeah you know we, <laughs> Uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I love continuing to play off of um, uh, off of our name and off of our theme. Yeah. So, yeah, like we're we're very, uh, you know, we're very, you know, we, we love to be part of sort of uh, mm -hmm. the community and certainly hype up sort of the, the role we play <laughs> in helping uh, data teams orchestrate their data. Wow, this is great. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, and also Christine says she does like your, uh, you know, thoughts on composing data tables like music. She loves okay. it. So we, you have an audience yeah. that appreciates uh, puns. So I, I'll take that. Yes, definitely. I'm sure about that. Okay. Uh, uh, also, you know, uh, I have a curious question about uh, what should one look for for in their first data leadership uh, role or getting into the leadership as well what should be you know what should they be looking at so th there's many sort of different questions in that so there's first how to you know within it, it's like how does one grow from an ic to a data leader so how does one go from an individual contributor to a data leader hmm. um the second is you know the second could be from a different perspective um if you're a company looking to hire uh, a data leader um you know what what should you be looking for so let me sort of let me answer that in my 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 own personal journey and some of the things that i've seen in terms of watching some of the folks that have uh, worked on my teams go on to you know build and lead great great data teams so first off kind of making that transition into data leadership uh is pretty challenging insofar as there's there's often many roles that are that are you know technical that are available to you know contribute directly when you're sort of transitioning to a leadership role you sort of you know take the hands off the keys a little bit and mm. you're you're really um trying to empower others in, in you know on your team to essentially have have a greater impact and to find scale through other people's uh work so typically one gets a data leadership role by effectively proving you know mm. excellence as an individual contributor having a specific uh domain where they are tr you know trusted and and you know have highly capable um but but you know transitioning to data leadership is a, is a totally different position now you have to mm. be able to essentially drive that impact of data analytics through other people's work basically exactly. that that often means curating that work there are so many sort of problems one can work on with data, so many ways to sort of misinterpret data, to waste time, um, to have non high, high value projects. There's, there's many data questions that can be answered that will have no impact on company or essentially spin the wheels for no particular reason. So when I think mm -hmm. about sort of transitioning into data leadership, um, there is, there's sort of this challenge of, um, how do you go from being, you know, individually highly, highly capable into, you know, finding that scale through other people? Typically, what that means is one good into again getting back to one of my favorite topics, causality. Good intuition about what's causing what, sort of pointing people in the right direction. But it, but the other thing to me is really understanding the equations of the business, the mm. ability to say, okay uh the the most important north star you know what what maybe 
you know, for us, we think of it as customers and revenue. Um, how do you take that, you know, that North star and turn it into, a, you know, an equation, which is to say, let's say, yeah. you know, we're talking about revenue. Well, revenue is basically customers times revenue per customer. So now you've taken sure. that, but having a, you know, and then, and then breaking down, well, revenue per customer, you know, is in some set or well, customers is, is simply, you know, leads times conversion rate. You know, exactly. and and then and then essentially breaking down the business, having a really solid understanding, and understanding where where in that equation do you think uh, the company is struggling, and being able to point people towards there's there's high value or having strong intuition about there's high value in essentially working on these types of problems, and and that's a challenging thing because you don't have the agency to do the work yourself. You have to uh, empower and skill up people to do the work at the same level that you want to put your name to. So that's exactly. one side of data leadership. The flip is when, if you're a company, when should you hire a data leader and what should that person look like? And, um, you know, the when has really changed. You know, I when I started my career uh, as a data leader, I had joined maybe three or four companies in a row as employee number 100. So typically, you know, when a team would, you know, get going, have a big engineering team and a lot mm -hmm. of those resources would be diverted towards dealing with data problems. And then finally, you know, the CTO would, you know, raise their hand and say, you know what we need to do? We need to bring in somebody that's going to be focused on, on the data, or we need to bring in not just an IC, mm -hmm. but a senior person that can, that can hire the right ICs. And, um, right. now that transition is happening earlier and earlier and earlier. So if you're a company, you know, not getting started in your data journey by the time kind of you have even a seed round is I think a mistake. I mean, there's a variety of toolings, including Mozart data that I think help companies get going very, very, very early in their journey. And, mm. um, you know, now we're seeing teams as small as, you know, two or three that are putting in good data infrastructure. Similarly, like teams, teams in their first 10 might make their first data hire. You know, a decade ago, that was extremely rare, unless, of course, you were a data company. So there's been a real transition towards making that data leadership a lot, lot earlier. Wow. And I think it, it totally makes sense in terms of you, you saying it, that uh, first it was maybe after the 100 employees, you know, joining in and then someone who would actually take care of the data infrastructure used to join but now it's a different scenario altogether which is uh fantastic information thanks for that peter and uh i see a very interesting question coming here from youtube uh from daniel uh daniel is asking how does mozart integrate with an azure data lake interesting sure. so um mozart is all about again like i said orchestrating data centralizing data um uh what that means in practice is that uh we help manage your el uh to to a data warehouse for us under the hood yeah. that's that's snowflake and uh and then essentially have a layer for transforming and cleaning data so real practitioners like a lot of your audience are going to be really familiar with just how much time a data team is spending not an analytics team not actually analyzing but actually cleaning Right. So, exactly. so much of our like romanticized profession is mostly sort of data cleaning work and janitorial sort of data janitorial work. So I would say that um, we sort of have a platform that's all about the all about the the cleaning of data and the um, you know, sort of the ability to transform that yep. data explicitly on, on the EL side, on the extract and load side, um, we connect to over, you know, 150 SaaS tools and databases. So um, there's just sort of automated um, extract and load uh, to your Snowflake warehouse. Okay, that's uh, pretty interesting. And uh, Daniel, if you stay with us, obviously we'll be talking more around Mozart data. And uh, I'm sure uh, Peter won't mind to give us a small, at least, uh, platform 
sneak peek to let us know how it works and what it actually does so feel free to stay with us uh daniel and you'll definitely have more questions or maybe you'll get more answers around that okay uh moving on i know there are a few questions that have come up but uh, just wanted to take this question and then i'm jumping into the audience again to take the questions so what according to you are the common pitfalls struggles of an early data team because obviously we've spoken about uh data leadership and you know how it has actually transformed since back then a decade and now but what about the team uh do you see similar um solutions for them or uh have and how have that you know the complete te team transformed would love to know more about that i think in any organization um a lot of teams it's not just the data team have these sort of yeah. virtuous cycles which is when they're able to prove value really quickly especially sort of more satellite teams so like core teams like back-end engineering you know is like always going to be a part of what a company does mm -hmm. um but like teams like the data team where the ceo may be a proponent or may not be a proponent you know it, it's all about proving that value really quickly and mm -hmm. the early pitfall for me is not you know sort of you know putting you know going sort of too perfect killing the good for the great so like what, you know, trying to do too deep of an analysis rather than, you know, trying to come up with what's typically called the 80-20 analysis, um, trying to like not really, uh, you know, do just, you know, get things done, but try to get things perfect. And that's actually going to be a real hindrance to getting quick early wins. And what quick early wins are going to do, it's going to essentially, again, get this virtuous cycle going where people are going to be hungry for more of those answers. They're going to say, wow, that mm. was that was really important to us. And 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 that's kind of the challenge of a data team. Um, you know, it's like, how do you get to answers? To, you know, what's your time to insight? Hmm. Okay. And just a contrary question to the above, obviously, uh, question was, what makes a strong data team, according to you? Yeah, I think so. One, uh, like pragmatism. So understanding mm -hmm. trade-offs, uh, you know, two, obviously having, you know, great internal customer relationships, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you know, often as a data team, you're, you know, in, internal focus, you're, you're essentially providing, you know, things that are going to accelerate the company uh, internally. To do that, you need champions of your service. You need champions to oh. believe that you're adding a lot of value. So I think, you know, strong data teams are the teams where the, the thing that they're most in trouble for is not having enough of themselves, right? So mm. you want to be, you know, kind of one of, one of the most, you know, valuable sought after kind of resources at the company just sort of uh amongst amongst your sort of internal uh peers and, and stakeholders okay uh that that is super fair and uh also in terms of uh just moving shifting gears a bit here mm -hmm. in terms of uh you know when obviously before talking about modern data stack i would love to uh you know obviously take a question from uh, the audience and uh, before getting into the modern data stack obviously Aditi has asked her uh, how would you explain modern data stack to a layman so we can get into the weeds then so, yeah great yeah well so so first of all modern data stack is 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 marketing it's marketing by companies like like Mozart data but also you know you know companies in the data warehousing space in the extract and load space and you know sort of in 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 sort of more downstream things like like BI, you know, data quality monitoring, observability. Um, what the modern data stack is is just um, what's happened in the last decade in the data space is just remarkable. So, hmm. uh, ten years ago, just to get started, you know, you would have to hire a bunch of data engineers to, to uh, you know, essentially extract your data uh, to a central warehouse. You'd have to pay you know, sometimes up to, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars to get, you know, a powerful data warehouse in place. And then you'd have to pay uh, a number of folks downstream to do analysis on it. So you could be talking about spending millions of dollars as a company before seeing your first uh, insight. And, you know, hmm. for, for big enterprises, that's a, that's a trivial amount of money. But for, you know, startups, that's, 
you know, essentially backbreaking amounts of money. And um, what the modern data stack is, is essentially this transition to uh, mm. the ability, you know, sort of having data look like, uh, like, you know, software engineering, where you see all of these, you know, companies that are, you know, building services that, that essentially mm -hmm. make it easier to get that going. Some are open source and free, some are, uh, you know, they're often coming out of, you know, great data teams, great data teams essentially built these things themselves because they found it accelerated them. So I was at a company called Yammer, um, at Yammer, um, I didn't have the opportunity to buy kind of services. We, um, we purchased, uh, you know, we, we hired data engineers and, and, and software engineers for the data team to build out things like a transform layer that, you know, oh. you should really build once and, and use kind of a best in, in class there. So, um, so I think you know the the modern data stack is the is the is is sort of making all of these sort of pieces fit together well so hmm. um, what are the pieces well everybody needs to uh, you know the the typical term is uh etl or elt right. um or I, I like to use the term etlt which is basically <laughs> uh, extracting data to a central warehouse and then essentially yeah. cleaning it up and um and that's that that's a lot of what the the Mozart data offering is, and I'd be happy to share a little bit about that. Um, yeah. So, so let me just very see if I can quickly kind of uh, take us take us through kind of what what yeah, I think. Yeah, please. Is. Uh, so this is a quick view of uh, the product uh, Mozart data, yeah. which is a view into a data warehouse. And like I said, it starts with connectors. Um, we have, this is a, a demo, but we have, you know, hundreds of connectors available, um, where for the most part, you just need credentials to get started. So if you're using right. like, maybe like everybody databases or Google ads or, or G sheets, um, it's very simple to connect those up and ultimately have them land in your warehouse. We have, uh, you know, yeah. tooling that allows you to explore essentially the data. And ultimately, we want you to be writing transformations. So we want you to be writing things that um, enable you to clean up your data. And here I've written this transformation in SQL. The more sort of SQL heavy a tool is, the more it's sort of democratized to more business yeah. users. Here, you know, the scheduling is really easy. It's done with a blue button and ultimately, you know, a simple uh, wow. drop down menu. And, but what I'm hoping is to get you not to stay in my tool, but to get you to a BI tool. So we give you your mm. Snowflake credentials and you hook up your BI tool. And in under an hour, you're able to start using whatever the BI tool or the reverse ETL tool of your choice is. So um, yeah. that's a quick view into what Mozart is. And a lot yeah. of that actually quickly reflects, you know, what it is that we do. So on, on top of it, you know, we have some basic tools for sending data to G sheets for lineage, um, for uh, tests as well. So the idea is how do you get teams, one, in the door and started quickly, but two, as they start really having more advanced needs, being able to service those or being able to connect, uh, you know, one of, you know, an elite BI tool or reverse ETL tool uh, to, your, to um, your own Snowflake. Yeah, no, I think it's pretty cool in a, uh... I did see the connectors, obviously, uh, obviously before we were even chatting and it was quite cool to have uh, so many in place. So, which is a plus plus. Okay, uh, since we are on that topic, uh, there was a question uh, around product which came up and I would love to take that question from George. Uh, what do you think makes your product so great? <laughs> And I love I love the softball. So, uh, yes. so thanks. So I, the the first is that I think it's the the easy button into the modern data stack. So when you hear about the modern data stack, and and I think this is why we get questions about the modern data stack, it's a very daunting picture. It's a landscape right. that's very rich with companies like doing every single piece of a you know a data team's work. These companies are often incredible partners of ours. So 
So I think that doing sort of a you know best in class work for a single slice of the modern data stack is the thing that's pushing our industry forward. Uh, the flip though is that it actually you know complicates things. And if you talk to folks that are implementing a modern data stack, they often do run into you know headaches in terms of setting it up, or they're doing evaluations of of multiple tools. Um, we think that there needs to be an easy button. So, you know, even a great data team is going to spend months setting up their, you know, modern data stack. Uh, maybe that's evaluating BigQuery versus Snowflake. Maybe that's, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, what's the best vendor for yep. EL? Should I use Fivetran? We want to make it so that in one hour, you get a best in class stack that experience is intuitive and there's really great UX so that you can um, really get those reports up and running quickly. The other thing that we do, which is actually hidden from the demo, is that we have an approach that's very similar to Superhuman. So Superhuman is uh, an, an email client that uh, also you know did Y Combinator like like we did, um, and you know in order to use Superhuman, they force you to have a 15 minute talk with somebody that yep. basically explains how to use email. Now, I've been using email since the 90s, so I don't know that mm -hmm. I needed somebody to tell me how to use email, but it's actually incredibly impactful. Giving somebody that first initial push in the back is, yep. is really a game changer. So getting people, getting their connect data connected, getting people started with a transform, joining data together. This is going to be really impactful in terms of getting companies going on their data journey rather than it just constantly being one month out. You know, often, you know, it's it's like my own sort of problems working out. You know, when am I going to start, you know, training for my, you know, my 5K? I'm like, well, I'm going to start <laughs> training tomorrow. And, you know, okay. if I keep start training tomorrow, that's going to happen like, you know, five years later, as opposed to, you know, five minutes later. So that's <laughs> really kind of some of um, some of what makes our collective product really amazing. Wow, this is fantastic. And I, I, I really like the attitude where you say it's like the early push. You Even if you know how to write an email, but you, if you get that push very quickly and uh, in a manner where it's more on the side where it can be automated, nothing like it. And uh, definitely that makes your product very strong. So thanks for sharing that, uh, Pete. And an amazing question, uh, George. Thanks again. Okay, uh, I'll put you in a tough situation. Obviously, which stack is the best according to you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, one more time. Which, which track? Well, yeah. I mean, come on. I, I would say Mozart data is the best. Uh, yeah. So, so I mean, that said, you know, we've made decisions uh, under the hood that basically speak to what we believe to be the best. So we have, yeah. um, you know, we have, you know, we've partnered with uh, Fivetran, which we think of as, uh, you know, sort of world class EL. We've, yeah. you know, we we leverage Snowflake, which we think of as the best uh, data warehousing solution. So, um, yeah. so you know, there's sort of implicit, um, there's implicit uh, opinions there. But um, you know, I, you know, separate from that, you know, I think what we think of as as the stack tends to be very personal. So, for instance, BI tools. So, I think how data gets to a certain place, and you know the ability to manipulate it and, and use it and and this and the speed and reliability there is no sort of you know there is no people aren't very different there but when yeah. it comes to bi when it comes to how to move and massage and and visualize and you know you know run counts and sums and averages um when it comes to doing that people are very particular so some people are tableau shops and some people are looker shops and some people like to write queries in mode and some people like you know to to have a very drag and drop experience so it depends like um for different companies you know they have different priorities some exclusively want a free bi tool you know they want to yeah. use something open source some companies you know are willing to pay uh for their bi tool because they're paying a lot of money to a data analyst so maybe make them as effective as possible so Ooh. So sort of downstream, we're much more agnostic. And what, what happens is, um, is that basically, you know, data becomes very quickly uh, uh, unique to a company. So hmm. sort of once it hits the data warehouse. So what I mean by that is, 
you know, there's all these SaaS tools that generate data in a standard way. That's why there are, you know, companies like, like Stitch and Fivetran that are able to sort of uh, have, have a routine way of pulling data and have a, a, a you know, essentially standardize uh, the, the tables that they're, they're putting into the data warehouse uh, from these, these tools. But as soon as it does, you know, um, you really need to know things about the business. I I'll give an example because you teed it up in the intro. So, uh, 10 years ago, Dan and I started a hot sauce company together. That company is bacon hot sauce. It was, uh, it was a really fun sort of side project that Dan and I worked on somewhere in the, yeah, I have like I have my bottles here somewhere, so I have like so I actually <laughs> so I can like pull out like I have my this wow. like an old hot sauce bottle of mine. So you know that was a business that you know was built on top of Shopify, hmm. and we'd want to know you know how is that business growing you know and that would be an interesting question to us and you know just exactly. this is a typical D 2 C type question you know how is my business growing, but one of the things that that you know we found to be important especially early on is, you know, we had to remove all of the people that had either my last name or Dan's last name from the customer list, because of course my mom was buying many, many exactly. bottles on our behalf. So, <laughs> so, you know, you know, there is no, you know, default field, uh, in, you know, in, in data, which is like remove people with my last name. That's exactly. like, um, you know, so I think that that's like specific knowledge that one needs because what we wanted to know is like, what, you know, how is the customer count going to actually grow and knowing how many, you know, bottles my mom bought is really irrelevant to that, to that problem because that she doesn't scale, uh, in an exponential way. Yeah. So, um, I think this is, this is, this is really important data becomes specific and that's when different companies can have different sort of flavors of what works best for them, depending on the skill set of the people in those seats. Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, fair enough, you know, uh, and I, I really liked your example there when, you know, you've just put it very clear and that makes it, you know, obviously the mozart way unique as well with your uh obviously your thought process it uh keeps you growing and keeps the brand growing so fantastic work there speed um okay uh moving forward i have a question from audience i would love to take from christine uh so this is a little different question on the leadership side uh do you think encouraging people in a company when they start to prepare to take on roles as citizen data analysts within an organization could prepare them to take leadership roles at early stages in their career. Interesting. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, uh, data fluency is now, um, is now commonplace in every single role of the, the C-suite. So I want to hit on one that, you know, for me, I've seen the biggest transition. So when mm. I got started, um, marketing teams were data phobic that sort of diving into data. You know, I, I worked uh, back in the day. I worked at, at this. I, I started my career in, in, in video games and in, in social gaming. And, oh. you know, it used to be sort of data phobic to, you know, uh, to it, it was almost like, a, a you know, everybody there was the the data team that sat over here there was the marketing team that was creative that sat over here and you it was like you know it was like almost crazy or not allowed to think <laughs> in similar ways um that very quickly changed so you know platforms like you know facebook and google and the and the sort of math behind uh you know their their second price auctions ended up very quickly sort of changing uh, the game and, you know, slowly, but surely, uh, it was the case that, you know, bigger and big, you know, more and more roles ended up sort of leveraging data or needing needed to leverage data or to have right. the same vernacular around it. So essentially becoming that citizen data scientist or the citizen data analyst, um, mm. uh, is, is now like almost table stakes for, for any role. So that's, you know, obviously finance folks had always had sort of that sort of mathy and data background, you know, in addition to the finance background, but, you know, now you see it in the product teams where they're all able to speak the language of product analytics and as well as business analytics. Um, you see it in, you know, marketing teams, you know, some of our best customers are actually from marketing ops, business ops, uh, sales ops, and it's really empowering them to do the data engineering work. This is sort of the last 
step in transitioning from the ability for a company to have citizen data analysts. Now you have them, they have the ability to have sort of citizen data engineers, which through companies like Mozart. Um, and that's really what we brag about. We brag that, you know, uh, you know, the, the citizen data analyst can go from, you know, uh, the data being generated in the SaaS tools all the way to a piece of analysis without needing to hire a data engineer. And I think okay. like that's a really powerful, you know, moment in time, but it's certainly the case that it's table stakes that, uh, you know, having that data fluency now is just a real part of every, every senior role. I'm um, now to different levels. You, you know, if you're a chief analytics officer at a company, um, versus, um, versus say being the CHRO, like, of course, there's going to be differences in uh, the way that you can think about data and, and assess and analyze the data. But I do think that in all of these cases, these roles all now rely to some extent on data. Hmm. That is uh, definitely very true and uh, super insightful, uh, Pete. Thanks, uh, thanks, Christine, for asking this question. Obviously, it clears kind of many things, um, uh, too many topics touched there. Okay, just a quick reminder for our audience who are uh, with us, uh, we'll be announcing the winners in just uh, after a few questions. So you have a chance to win an annual subscription of 365 Data Science. Feel free to put in hashtag 365 Data Science in the chat and we'll get the ball rolling i have some fancy thing that i'll be doing and there'll be a winner that will be picked from those who have entered uh, into the raffle so looking forward to that uh, but uh, again um wanted to know more about your company future plans uh pete uh, what's next for mozart data how are you looking at things yeah so uh you know we're a COVID company meaning we got started in april of yeah. 2020 so actually we've been fully remote for um, you know, for our entire existence. Wow. Um, so, you know, we've been, been actively trying to grow our, uh, user base, our customer base, our, uh, team. Mm. So really the things that are excited, we, uh, last summer we graduated from Y Combinator and, and raised a seed round and have been, you know, growing, uh, the team, the company and the capabilities very aggressively, uh, over the last 18 months. Um, we're now, uh, you know, 20 folks with a bunch of thank you, great customers that really can, you know, leverage our software as their sort of, uh, as their data engineering. And we feel really wow. proud about that. And we've, we've seen companies, you know, quickly take off in their data capabilities. And this is exactly what we want. We want somebody that's very savvy about data, that understands data, that kind of knows what they want from data. But we actually want to, um, you know, turn those people, let those people loose and let them worry about the tough part of analytics, which is, um, you know, finding real gems and nuggets within the data, as opposed to what had traditionally been the tough part, which is just, uh, getting data from one place to another. So we think of that as effectively a solved problem and we want to make sure that, you know, teams can do it. We do have a blog. We like to, you know, share content about how we think about, yeah. you know, um, you know, all of these, you know, uh, standard buzzwords in the data space, but also, you know, how to get started. This is really what we're passionate about. What we're passionate about is getting people, so, you know, I, I, again, I, just to use the analogy, I use, I, I have a couple of workout apps and I don't even use the workout apps for following the regimens that they're suggesting. I use it just as a forcing mechanism to get me to do something. And, right. um, and I see delight in my face when I come back from a, uh, a brutal, uh, you know, first workout in a long time, but I also see, uh, you know, delight in maybe a trainer's face if they've sort of tricked me into, you know, getting, getting up out of bed and going for even a short run. So I think mm -hmm. like that's kind of what, um, what we brag about in, in the sort of, uh, in the data world, which is we get people started. Um, and that's, that's a, that's a really powerful thing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, thanks for that lovely information. What I've done is obviously I've shared uh, the website with the folks in the chat section so they can actually have a look at it and uh, they can learn more about it. I really like the blog section. Uh, and uh, it's something obviously not only just limited to the, uh, you know, the about 
obviously about just the company but there is all uh, there there are a ton of information in there so thanks for that peter um, uh, definitely i am jumping in there and you know learning about different buzzwords also which are new to me and which are it's all about sure. community right exactly and you sort of understand from the show and you know we like to you know we do webinars and we're you know trying to you know be you know here today this morning to just share exactly. about what we're doing and and really kind of share best practices because these skills have been siloed in late stage companies and yeah. public companies and large companies. And we want to really make that available to, uh, to everyone. Fantastic, Peter. This was amazing information. And I appreciate you be coming on the show and sharing about what you're doing for definitely the community and uh, helping a lot of companies there. So thanks for uh, such an amazing and insightful session. Uh, just a quick question. Obviously, before that question, I would love to just announce our winners. Uh, people have been very uh, kind to stay patient with us. And uh, let's do this. Let's uh, do this fancy stuff of giveaway. Uh, okay, we have 10 entries and it's good time to actually roll out uh, the winner. Let's see who the winner is. And... The winner is Meul Shah. Meul Shah, uh, congratulations. You win an annual subscription of 365 Data Science. I'll reach out to you and you can learn more. They have fantastic courses at 365 Data Science. Thank you very much, for everyone, for participating. I always give away annual subscription for 365 Data Science. Feel free to always uh reach out in uh, you know obviously uh, participate in such competitions uh okay peter uh, uh would love to let our audience know if they want to reach out learn more about uh, uh modern data st stack and uh about uh, mozart data which is the best place if they w have questions where can they reach out to you yeah obviously you can reach out to me directly i'm pete at mozartdata.com uh, yeah. Similarly, you can find out more information uh, about us at mozartdata.com. And if you're interested in the product, we have you know 14 day free trial. And similarly, if you mention uh, the Robert Show, we'll give you a special. Oh, awesome, Peter! Thank you very much uh, for visiting the Robert Show. I can't wait, obviously, uh, for a 2.0 version uh, for you to be on the Robert Show and share more develop uh, developments that happen uh, at Mozart Data. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and see you soon. Uh, Pete, thank you very much. Thank you.